Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Saturday's Five Properties Show. And today's topic, Jim, spread your lets. Oh, you better watch it and they say that. I know, <laughs> say that I the right way. Spread your <laughs> lets. It could come out. Yeah. It could come out the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I did think the same when I first read it. But yeah, spreading your lets and looking at whether it's time to diversify your lettings portfolio. Now, this yeah. is probably something that everybody's considered that um, does have a uh, property. And although long-term lettings to professional tenants and uh, are, are, are easily the most hands-off way, do you know, professional tenants who are there for the long term, it is the best hands-off way of being a landlord. They're not your only option. There is a lot of other options out there. Mm -hmm. um, now, we've previously covered um, rent to families. We've done a, a show on that one. And we've got the blog there, attracting high-income earners and even the eco-friendly landlord and in the, the uh, blog that's attached to this show the links to those take you back into our blogs and you yeah. can read them um mm -hmm. but today we're going to go off uh pissed a wee bit and um into other areas of the lettings market yeah you've been in for a night in the town so <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> i know i know i know <laughs> you had to pick up on it Jim. you had to pick up on it. Anything anyway. can happen the next hour. That's exactly what it is. And that's, <laughs> that's what it's like. Being live, I know, I know. There's no going back. Um, so. I just say hello to the TikTokers and yeah. also Instagram as well, guys. Um, if you've got any questions, we'll answer them at the end for everybody. Uh, if it is pertinent to what we're doing right now, uh, which is the, uh, is it time to diversify your lettings portfolio into yeah. other areas, then yeah, well, absolutely. We might take this into account as well. Uh, anyway, Richard, over to you again. Yeah, yeah. So we are live, obviously, as you've just clearly seen. I, Jim's streaming on Instagram and TikTok. Please join in, guys. Uh, comment, and we will try and address all the comments as we go if we can. If not, we'll try and get to them at the end. But yeah, so if you're curious about the nuts and bolts of alternative buy-to-let models, make yourself comfortable because we're going to cover them this morning. And we're going to go over things like the pros and cons of diversifying your portfolio. We'll look at student lets. We'll look at holiday lets. We're going to talk about HMOs and short term and corporate letting as well. Do you know, when I was thinking about this subject this morning, I was thinking about Fife and it's like, you think about student lets, you've got St Andrews, you think about holiday lets, you've got the East Nuke, you think about uh, HMOs, it's obviously St Andrews as well. And in short term and corporate lets, you think about the more built up areas and Fife's got it all, it really does. There's, there's It's segregated by all one place. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm biased by the way, because obviously yeah, well, I am Fife and we're working Fife as well, but but um, it has been said right throughout uh, all the um, economic uh, forecasts and that saying that um, Fife is a true reflection of the, the economy itself of, of the yeah. whole of Britain. Uh, you've got St Andrews, which is the London of Fife, and you've, you've got the other end and everything that happens in the middle. And Fife yeah. is split a bit like 50-50 in terms of its um, industrialisation uh, and mm -hmm. also farming community. Um, and fishing community in that as well, and the uh, countryside and rural and urban. Um, so, so Fife is a great microcosm of the whole of Britain. And generally, what you see happening in Fife um, on a smaller scale is usually typically what happens uh, outside the, the the whole of Britain as well. Yes, it's just like a smaller a, a smaller version of the the, the whole country. Um, but yeah, but just like any investment strategy, there are plenty of factors to consider before you make a leap into some. Uh, so a different avenue and diversifying your portfolio and things. Yeah. So let's explore the different options and see if any are maybe right for you. And we're going to start off, like I said, with the pros and cons of actually diversifying your portfolio. So yeah. many successful landlords, Jim, pick a single rental sector, fully master it and stick to it. And, and that's great. And for others, variety makes life a little more interesting. So we're going to cover the pros and cons, but Jim, just I mean yourself, obviously being a landlord and investor, should I say, for for a lot of years now. Did you see you've stuck to to one kind of niche and one a uh, uh, kind of rental sector and and mastered it? Yeah. Have you explored others? I've I've looked at it time and time again in terms of what the rental market's like, and I've often looked at you know opportunities from other places like the HMOs, like student lets, um, yeah. short term corporate lets, holiday lets. And things like that as well. But you know, I'm a big, big, big fan. I've been taught by you know very wealthy people, you know, yeah. rich dad of rich dad, poor dad, um, who was actually Keith Cunningham. Um, and and Keith says, you know, stick to your knitting um, and, mm -hmm. and eat your own cooking, um, and that's what you need to do. And I know it sounds daft by saying 
stick to your knitting. You need your own cooking from somebody that's like mega wealthy. What's all that about? Well, yeah. stick to your knitting is all about do what you do well. And do you eat your own cooking is like, do you eat, do you do what you actually teach? And if you don't, then you probably don't have a clue about what you're talking about. And um, so I think that's the most important lessons that I've learned. So I I, I focus solely on on what, what most people would call vanilla lets, which is, you know, yeah. a what it makes a shitload of money. <laughs> but you, you say that time and time again, boring pays well. Boring pays well every single time. I'm happy to be bored on every single occasion. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's just like bang, bang, bang. You know, it just keeps coming in. That money just yeah. keeps flowing in regardless if you've got your system set up properly. And all you're doing is, uh, is now and again, you're firefighting certain situations. But if you've got enough proactivity uh, in terms of your property investment strategy, um, then 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 you don't need to worry about things like that. Because often things that that happen can, and, and, and put you at risk a wee bit can be offset by the opportunities that you've actually developed before, which actually make a lot more income, which can offset that. And the classic yeah. example is if you can't get somebody out of your property and they're not paying their rent, then you've got a whole load of other properties that are actually paying their rent as well, and that kind of offsets it. Although I get a bit upset about that. Because if people don't pay their rent when they can't pay their rent, this is a deliberate attempt by some people. They, yeah. they, they can't pay and they just won't pay because that's their that's their mentality. Um, then it's not me losing out. Doesn't make any difference to me. It's a fund as far as I'm concerned. I only get paid a certain amount out of that fund um, every month, regardless. Um, but if they don't pay, then someone else suffers because yeah. it's maybe a kitchen, it's maybe a bathroom that could be installed and it's going to be installed later on now because this person hasn't paid and it was relying on them paying as well. So that's what I talk about with the fund element and the fact that everybody contributes to this fund in order to help everyone else grow as a natural result. Now, everybody goes, well, what's with that about? That's a bit like, that's a bit like communism. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, well, it's it's social capitalism, I would call it. Yeah. Um, so social capitalism is quite good for me because um, it makes me a decent return. But the great thing is, obviously, I own them. So my payoff is in a pension, which is actually the capital wealth as it appreciates over all the years that I've had it. Now, no surprise when a lot of people realise that um, I've, I've, been in, I've been doing this for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I probably have a good handle on what I'm talking about. It's amazing this morning I was, <laughs> I was sitting saying there was people on... Um, uh, the UK Landlords Forum, and they were going to be, I've got this letter from a lawyer, and they're threatening that they could get me for X amount of the deposit, and I went, just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. it. Just ignore it, and everybody's going, that's terrible, you shouldn't be ignoring it, you should be taking legal advice and everything like that, and I went, by the sound of that letter you've just, they've just sent, they're just chancing their arm, and the very yeah. fact that you engage with it um, actually makes it, brings uh, oxygen to the fire, and actually makes mm -hmm. it worse. Um, because it gives them a reason that they think they're actually getting somewhere. Whereas, whereas most solicitors, when they send letters out like that, are just opportunistic. They're just yeah. doing it on behalf of a client who thinks they're aggrieved, when in actual fact they're not, because the guy's got his full deposit back. And then he obviously thinks because the landlord should have lodged the deposit correctly, because the landlord didn't lodge the deposit correctly, they're, they're trying to claim it, they deserve all that money back, including mm -hmm. the rent. It's like you're having a laugh. There's nothing <laughs> in the legislation that says that. And yeah. even if the tribunal or, or any court got a hold of this, they go, but you, you got the full deposit back anyway. So what was the problem? The landlord yeah. maybe never followed the rules, but you never suffered financially because of it. That's the key here. Yeah, Most, so. That's what a lot of people don't believe in about legal situations. Unless the other party has suffered financially because of it, then if, the, if it's not a criminal thing, then the, the, the court will just look at that and, and, and just go, and they'll just laugh and throw it out. I know, and so then it's just about reading everybody's thing. Having that experience, Richard, is the most important yeah. thing. Um, and, you know, I just wrote back to that person and said, you know, whatever you want to say, this isn't a question time. It's like, <laughs> this is my experience and advice. I'm not asking for anybody to debate with me about it. This is the facts based on my personal opinion and my own experience of what we call ambulance chasers, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and they're just... Yeah, they're just sitting there looking for opportunities to try and make a bit more money out of a, of, of a, a situation which which isn't really there. They're trying to make up a situation to get fees. Yeah. That's the sort of that's that sort of solicitor, um, I would say. Yeah, at this, this but yeah opp opportunistic, definitely. Definitely. So it's that experience. Uh, it, it has a huge benefit to landlords. 
probably when the work was as well, because we yeah. know that and they don't need to worry about that. Therefore, they're able to save their fees as well because it's based on a on on wisdom rather than actually going through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, occasions when landlords come to me with a situation and they're, do you know, they're worried about it because they don't have the knowledge to deal with it or don't know what the right thing. And and I, I reassure them, look, it's nothing to worry about. It's fine. We'll deal with this, or I'll, or I'll help you through what you need to do. Um, so it's all about knowledge and experience as well. Definitely. It brings me back, you know what it reminds me, and it brings me back, uh, you're going to get bored of these stories because you'll hear them quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, have I heard this one? It brings me back to the days that I used to get loads and loads of letters when I was a financial director and financial controller in industry running some manufacturing companies. I used to get loads of letters from the creditors saying that you're due us this and you're due us that and you're due us this. And, and then, then, uh, and I was getting all worried about it, thinking, "Oh God, everybody's chasing me for money." And then, then, I, then I realised it was like a, a, a computer spewing out letters. Yeah, it's just <laughs> and generic. No one's chasing this. This is just a standard procedure set up by a program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then it was like every time I got a letter, I just went in the bin every single time. Now that doesn't mean to say you don't pay your your suppliers. No, no. One of the things I did learn in industry, and which is quite an important one to anybody that's wanting to get into property investment, want to be a landlord or a letting agent, is you better make damn sure you pay your suppliers pretty quick, your contractors. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, if you don't do that, they're not in the business of credit control. They're not in the business of having to chase money. And they will do anything for a customer that pays them on time every time for yeah. a job that they've done. And they'll jump through hoops for you when you need them. That's yeah. the most important thing, I think, about building a good relationship with suppliers. As a letting agent, as a landlord, even as, even as, a, as, as, a, as a layman customer um, every single time, because they will come back and they will deliver and they will do jobs for you every single time. There's no surprise when I lift the phone from my own house even to get things done and I say, I can, you, know, my, you know, my heating's down or something like that. It's okay, we'll be there tomorrow. We'll be there tomorrow morning. I thought you were busy. No, no, for you, it'll be fine. And, and that's the sort of thing you've got to understand. So it's it's acknowledging people and doing letting them, and, and, and paying them for the job that they've done um, so they don't become that. So there's another wee top tip for people that are looking to get into property investment and uh, and work with contractors, because I, I hear that quite a lot. Oh, I can't get them to do a job on time, or I can't get them to, you know, to respond to me when I try to get back to them. It's like, well, maybe that's maybe the issue for you. Sometimes it's no, sometimes that's just the type of contractor they are. And therefore, we no longer work with them. Yeah, but yeah, but definitely yeah. keep your keep your contractors on site and be good yeah. players. Because I mean, contractors are a very important thing. Let's but, get back to this because I yeah. changed the total project and you get right off track. Yeah, you went right off track, but it's fine. It's all it's all relative. So, uh, di yeah, diversifying your portfolio and it could really widen your opportunity to expand into new locations. We spoke about the different locations in Fife and how they have um, a niche uh, for each different type of let. Uh, learn about different markets and even explore your inner interior design and things. A lot of people like to look at different property types and, and put their stamp on it. Uh, and we've covered that in a lot of shows as well. Um, along with all the... It's interesting that you say that about, you know, explore your interior design. Uh, I, I'm going to be quite uh, contentious today, Richard. So yeah. when you're saying yeah. things, I'm going to I'm going to debate the other side. And the other side of yeah. that is, um, you good. know, I often, you often see it on these shows like, um, you know, Sarah Beanie does and yeah. uh, Phil Spencer, Phil and Kirsty do. And and it's often people that's uh, uh, they want who want to get into property because I really like I really like interior design. I really like uh, yeah, you know, interior like, designer. Like, then this sounds like a bloody hobby. And it's like if this is a hobby, you'll get a hobby income out of this, or you yeah. or worse, it will be a financial disaster for you because you're going into it for all the wrong reasons. The the whole reason about buy you know we can we can talk about it and we can gloss it up. But at the end of the day, every single business and everything i was arguing with somebody this morning about this, if this is a business or not buy to let and and as far as the hmrc are concerned uh, schedule a income which is actually taxed as uh, property investment income is not a business as far as the hmrc are concerned even though you have a lot of properties which they actually said to me the guy says look i'm going to go back and check with the with the with the boss um, at HMRC mm -hmm. because you've got a lot of properties and this isn't an investment. This is actually yeah. a business you're running. So you might have better um, uh, opportunities to actually have better tax allowances and better uh, deductions. And, uh, and he came back. I knew he was going to come back. I'm an accountant. He didn't know I was an accountant, by the way, because I don't tell them that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because then it puts them on their heckle straight away. I like to get catch them off guard. Um, so he came back and says, "No, it's uh, it's just try it's just classed as investment income." And you know, I'm sorry for that. And I went, "Yeah, it's okay. 
it's okay. I, <laughs> I knew that anyway. <laughs> I knew that anyway. He didn't come in at one point in time. He says, God, for a landlord, he says, I've never seen an exception, such exceptional record keeping. And all my times has been as a tax inspector. And I'm like, no, oh, I wonder why that is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get back yeah. to it. So, uh, explore your inner thoughts and stuff like that, and new locations, and, and, and you know, I'm not a big fan of yeah. um, change. I'm not big, the weird. Eh? I'm not a big fan of change. If it works, I don't think anybody else. But you need to embrace it. I think just yeah. slightly adapt it. I'm a, I'm yeah. a like get it right and get it working properly, and then you know just just slightly adapt to each time and 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 it's like the we it's like the magnifying glass in the sun and you've got the paper and you're lighting it you know everybody used to try and do that and you've got the the papers on fire and you've got it in line with the sun and what happens is legislation maybe moves the sun a wee bit you know you metaphorically so legislation comes in moves it interest rates change and moves it so you're no longer on fire anymore so so what you need to do is you just need to adapt slightly you don't need to change anything miraculously and and do any miraculous you know outstanding thing to oh look what i've done i'm going completely in a different direction no you don't need to do that all you need to do is adapt adapt slightly and then then you're on fire again and you're, yeah. you're, you're wired and fired and you're, and you're producing income and you're producing investments and you're growing in wealth as well. That's why you want to do things like that. We'll never get through this if I don't stop talking. Eh? It's all right. It's fine. You've kind of covered what I was going to say because I'm like, along along with all the fun stuff, like obviously people may like to you know, think about like interior design and all this, and but there are a lot of new rules and regulations and tax policy and uh, things that you need to learn which can be useful for your, in your entire wealth management. Yeah. Um, but also complex and time consuming. And this is where your this is where an agent comes in as well. If you're gonna especially if you're gonna that, have a float my boat. That that, yeah. that to me is more exciting than interior design about the tax implications yeah. and the changes yeah. in the rules and stuff like that. So you know, but that, that that's a fantastic thing, and you know a lot about that as well. All, mm -hmm. Although other models can give you a higher income from property, they all come with extra costs. This is actually what I keep saying, and um, we've noticed this time and time again. Where a lot of people get into short term their service accommodation and holiday lets, yeah. um, but they don't realise that their running costs are astronomical in terms of yeah. just general having to pay people to do things and the, yeah. and the changeovers, and um, but also um, your time and get, you get involved because if people want to have a hands-on experience they usually last about a year maybe two years at a push doing it themselves and they go yeah. i'm sick to death of this i can't even go on holiday i can't have a break at doing anything because i'm tied to this uh, all, you know, you know, one it. holiday let that i thought would be fantastic i just want a mainstream letter and and for some that is possible because they paid cash so they don't have a mortgage but for a lot of have actually paid a mortgage they have to exit and sell because they, they can't afford to let mainstream because they won't get the income they'll get to cover the mortgage um, they would have got from service to accommodation uh, and actually doing it themselves. Um, yeah. So it relies on them doing it themselves. The model that they've built relies on them doing it themselves, service to accommodation, and they can't change to someone else doing it because the costs are too prohibitive to make any type of money at all. Um, so just just if you're going to be doing service accommodation, make sure you look at your numbers first before you actually start and make sure you look at your tolerance limits as well uh, in terms of where you are. If you can afford for somebody else to do it, if anything happens to you on or less or, or less, it's all based on your ability to, for, to perform. And yeah. my investment strategy was never going to be based on my ability to perform. Because if anything happens to me, God forbid, we're out of business. That would, all fall, that would all fall apart, yeah. Yeah, it would just fall apart. So it needs to run without me being there. Yeah. It needs to run without my input sometimes because anything could happen to me. And I got that analogy from uh, airline pilots because they have to have, pass a physical every year or every yeah. quarter or something like that. If they don't pass that, they're no longer be able to be a pilot. Their income's wiped out. Um, surgeons who need their hands to do a, a intricate surgery, brain surgeons yeah. and stuff like that. If they, anything happens to their hands, they could be doing DIY, Zoop, boom, their hands goosed. Yeah, their whole they, livelihood they, at the window, yeah. Their livelihood is lost. So I didn't want anything to be based on my ability to, to perform, and that was the ultimate goal. And that should be the ultimate goal for most people in, in investment strategies, not to try and do it yourself. Yeah. Definitely, and like you said, the the the, uh, the student lets and the the uh, the HMOs and things they they have a really great time investment, and I think in a nutshell, additional income from diversifying your portfolio and thing isn't 
entirely passive yeah. um, and it does it doesn't equate to a pure outfit so consider your time and enjoyment as well as the money at the same time think about that balance because you really will have to you really will have to um sacrifice time if you're going to do all that so student lets student lets is uh, what we're going to look at and uh, renting to students means that you can maybe let each room in a property as a bedroom individually and significantly significantly increase the rental amount for the the one individual property but there are some basics that things that you really need to get right with student lets um so firstly i mean choosing the location mm -hmm. location is all i mean there's no point in having a student let when it's in the country <laughs> Do you know when it's nowhere near a uni or a college? You would, or... think, you would think that's obvious, but for some people, it's just not that obvious. You so that. You, you sometimes have to spell that out, don't you? It's Although, like make sure there's at least one university campus, yeah, um, yeah. and and it has a, a cheap supermarket around about at a Lidl's or an Aldi, yeah. um, and some budget-friendly places to socialise yeah. as well. I think that's the most important thing. Cafes, what, 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 yes. When we're going about things like furnishings, you know, what what should we be, what should we be looking at? Well, if you're doing an, an individual room in each property for a student, I mean, each room is going to have to have maybe like a wardrobe um, mm -hmm. to store their stuff in, something that's sturdy, uh, a bed, a desk for them to study at, um, skimping on quality for um, furnishings and things for a student. Let is, I mean, it's just counterproductive because it, you pay, you obviously pay cheap, pay twice. So, I, mean, I used to use, um, I was quite lucky, I worked with Martin Tosh, the furniture maker, mm -hmm. um, so I used to be, I, I was lucky enough to be able to use um, or get some of their uh, overruns of their other returns mm -hmm. from the um, furniture fits they did for some of the PFI projects for maybe um, uh, homes and stuff like that, so they would have yeah. tall boys, so they would have the, the wardrobe yeah. at the top and the two drawers at the bottom, but these things were rock solid. It's like you could drive you could drive a tank over them they'd still be stuck <laughs> yeah they they were, like that. They were very robust and they cost me 90 quid at the time to buy and they mm -hmm. lasted for years upon years upon years until i stopped doing furnished lens yeah yeah and they i think about it we having a tip somewhere and they'll still be intact <laughs> <laughs> like, it'll, be like this, it'll be like the top gear thing when they put the toyota land cruiser on top of the building and blew it up and when it landed it still started and they drove away <laughs> that, that's kind of what Marantosh uh, furniture was like at the time. They don't make that anymore. They're only involved no. in PFI, which no, is it's more like IKEA flat packs. Don't last yeah. that long now. So, but yeah, and also like things like um, think about if you're doing individual rooms, you need to have it, have it private and a lock on each door and things. Can there's a lot of things to think about like that. Yeah. And also, I think in a in a property that's going to be students, you need to ensure there's like a kitchen that's large enough to facilitate everybody individually. Um, they have a table to eat at, they've got cupboards and plenty of storage space, uh, a fridge that's got enough space in it. Uh, you might even need to buy two fridges. You, you don't yeah. know. Do you, know I... you get fridges with lockable cabinets inside. Yeah. Trust me, <laughs> trust yeah. me. When I was at Stirling University, we were on the Graduate Enterprise Programme, which was organised by the Scottish Government. And, uh, and, and I tell you, if you didn't have anything under lock and key, um, because it was a communal kitchen, and yeah. your communal yeah. fridge, um, then everybody else would just use it and think that's quite normal. It's like, oh, yeah. well, I just thought I'd have a bit of yours. It's like, holy shit, I was waiting to eat that. It's like, I was <laughs> looking forward to that. That was going to be the highlight of my night. And you've just scoffed it. Um, yeah. So under lock and key, I would say, when you get to fridges, definitely. But you do get fridges on the market that have that in containers that you can do that. Yeah, they have a lot of designs like that now as well. I think it's also important to remember, I mean, students are young sociable and they often like to hang out at home and kitchen parties and all the rest of it so keep things cheap so uh, i mean if you think about like you this richard <laughs> <laughs> not anymore not anymore i'm much funny <laughs> uh, yes yeah, so look for properties that won't cause a disturbance to neighbors try and find something where they could make a bit of noise and be sociable without upsetting everybody uh, i know that's a problem in the St Andrews area sometimes you've got these HMOs and things yeah. and a lot of neighbours find it difficult to live because during the uh, semesters and things the noise and it's just only natural it's just what students do um, mm -hmm. they just they make a lot of noise it's what young people do so um, yeah so these are all things to think about with student lets yeah definitely I mean you, you know uh, the, the older generation I've got to admit myself included you know pitchforks and torques and torches <laughs> out you know if there's any noise at all in the street so it does get a bit contentious for for the residences and Andrews 
Uh, while they welcomed the students and the uh, increase in the popularity of the area, um, they did actually retire there to, for quiet peace and enjoyment. Yeah. And, uh, and they don't want load, load, loads of parties next door and stuff like that. And that's what some of the properties actually have been converted to, to HMOs for that reason, uh, because mm -hmm. it matches the income for the landlord. Therefore, the local council have actually put a moratorium on, um, on the actual number yeah. of HMO. So when they're coming up for renewal, they're just saying, it's not in a desired area anymore. The residents are actually up in, up in arms um, against it, and therefore we're not going to grant your HMO license. And for some people that have actually bought with HMO license, possibility on it, because remember, it follows the person, not the property. Yeah. Um, therefore, uh, when that doesn't go up for renewal, your, the value of your property can drop from 500,000 to about 400,000 or less, because it's no, like longer, it's no longer going to generate that income. Because mm -hmm. remember, HMO having that license actually treats it as a commercial property, a commercial mm -hmm. venture, and it and it's and it's forced appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, like in America, they've got commercial. That's American thing. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Forced appreciation, which actually moves it up because it's the return on investment is forcing the value. Um, in this country, you don't really get forced appreciation anymore. As such, you'll get it um, at, at the 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 best. Uh, the best degree is in uh, commercial lets and, and yeah. that is HMO classics. Uh, but it's still very, very difficult to ascertain whether you're actually going to get that granted again. So it, it gets people a, you know, a bit of nervousness to have to check with a solicitor. So always check the solicitor that HMO license is going to stay in place and it will be transferable to you when you buy an HMO from someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously we move on for student lets and, and we'll speak about holiday lets now. Holiday yeah. lets can be actually quite controversial. I mean, you think about East Newark, you think about Edinburgh, and, and, and right across the country at the minute, I think they're quite controversial because they're everywhere. Uh, I, feel, and, I feel for people in, in the more rural areas, yeah. uh, uh, you know, fishing villages and stuff like that as well, we have had that quiet peace and enjoyment for all these years. Um, but the increase of tourism has led to the um, possibility of having more holiday lets and service accommodation. Yeah. Now, it, it, it is growth and it is change over time. And this could be applied right to any place outside, you know, in the whole of the UK. Um, and and we do welcome tourism as well. Um, yeah, but yeah. with tourism, you know what happens. If you want the tourists to stay, you have to find somewhere for them to be. If you don't have enough uh, hotel accommodation because no one can supply that, then obviously service accommodation is going to be the one that everybody will go for. And, yeah. and so I can't, it's it's a balancing act about getting the right mix in a community. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of communities out there that say, we don't want holiday lets. It's like, okay, then you don't want tourism then because a lot of these people will turn up for a day and then they'll go away and they'll not spend their money anymore. Therefore, your shops and your restaurants won't get that um, income. Therefore, the people that work in there won't have that job anymore. Therefore, there will be no need for you to stay in the area because you won't have an income. So your, your yeah. place will die completely. Do you know, I, I watched, uh, I don't know if you watched on TV, Simon Reeves. Um, he was down in the Lake District and it was just a prime example of what's happening across the whole country and here in Fife as well and like East Newcombe things. And this little village in the Lake District and there was just a handful of original uh, residents that live there and the rest were all holiday lets. And he spoke yeah. to this woman and she was, she'd been there all her life, an older lady, and was totally against it. And then we spoke to her son and he was totally for it because he was running a business and making money and being able to still live there. Do you know, Absolutely. so it's like, uh, and it was a really good example of what's happening right across the whole country. And the very yeah. fact that he makes the money is he's able to afford to stay there now. Yeah, yeah. That was the the prices point, yeah. are a lot higher. Because if they weren't there, the prices would be lower, but they thought he wouldn't have a business anymore, but he'd have a smaller business, therefore he'd still be able to afford the place. So yeah. it's it's a, it's a trade-off of what you really want. Um, I, I think that's the most important thing to remember about the holiday let market. But remember, we don't have a private renting sector crisis here. We don't mm -hmm. have a housing crisis here. The only thing in this country that we have is a social housing crisis. Yes. That's the problem. If we solve the social housing crisis issue, everything else would fall into place. It would be yeah. okay. Private renter sector's fine. Holiday sector's fine. Owner occupiers are fine. But the thing that's the problem here is the social housing sector. Yeah. They've got the problem, not us. But they seem to put it on us all the time. It's quite an interesting one, an interesting way to look at it. That is, yeah, definitely. 
But yeah, back to the the, the holiday lets and and like we just kind of outlined there, living like a local while on holiday has become hugely popular among tourists seeking a more authentic experience than the hotel, like you said, Jim. And a stylish holiday let in the right location can be a real earner. If I mean through peak seasons, it really can. Uh, but that being said, there's a lot of initial setup ongoing, you know, work that goes into that. Uh, there's higher management costs if you use an agent to do that for you. And there's mm. a certain criteria that you need to meet to do holiday letting as well. And and firstly, to qualify for the special tax rules and things around that as well. Um, there's a link in the blog here that takes you to the government website for that. Um, yeah. A property must be available as a holiday let for a certain amount of time. I think it's around about 210 days per year uh, to be rented out for at least 105 of these. And uh, with each booking being no more than 31 days, or then it obviously goes into uh, out with the realms of holiday let in short term. Um, yeah. So to bag all, and also to bag those all important five star reviews, you'll need to obviously uh, proof check your process plus a reliable cleaner. You need a handyman. You need to keep the property in perfect condition. You, know, you walk into holiday let, so if you do like short, I mean, I've been in a few and you go in and it, it's immaculate and that's the way it needs to be especially yeah. when you're charging those kinds of prices. And that's for every booking. And that's where the ton, the changeover comes see, in. I, I, I go to see a seller and they say, oh, my friends were saying I should be a, it should be a holiday let. And I just look around and think, <laughs> you've got a big mountain to climb then. Yeah, you've, got a lot, you've got a lot to do, yeah. Because right. you're going to have to completely gut this property. You're going to have to yeah. make it legally compliant in terms of electricity, in terms of gas, in terms of everything in terms of Legionella testing, in terms of smoke alarms, in terms of heat detectors, in terms of carbon monoxide, in terms of the heating itself, in terms of EPC. And it's like, there's a huge mountain for you to climb and they just wait, oh, well, I'll just sell it. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> and then even on top of that, yeah, even on top of that, Jim, it's like, it's not just like, obviously, um, with a long-term residential, you, guests who are coming in at holiday let, they want, they want Luro, they want shower gels, they want hand soap, washing up liquid, dishwasher tablets is a big one if you've got dishwasher. You need all the yeah. basic cooking utensils. Do you know what I mean? Provide information about, um, obviously, tips and things about the locals and instructions on the heating, recycling, Netflix. I mean, the list goes on. There's a lot. And and that's where there's a misconception because as, as I said, I go back to when I when I meet people, their phone, their friends say we should make a we should have a holiday let, and it's like what impression have you got in your mind of what it takes to run a holiday let in terms of investment of money and also in terms of investment of your time? That's yeah. a hell of a lot of both. Yeah, definitely. And then I think and as people might look at it as pound signs sometimes because the, the the peak seasons generate such a lot of. Um, money compared to long-term residential but then remember you need to have to have a successful holiday like you need to do all that plus yeah. you need to have a year round and a destination that's going to be popular uh, to avoid long periods with no bookings or then it's just it won't be worth your while at all um, and if everything's closed in the winter and things then your income uh, and occupancy rate will just nosedive really so you need to, yeah <laughs> that's, that's effectively you've got to make sure some of your main shops are still open and if you don't have that they they will be um, um they will be they will be no desirable i mean you no know, where i am in spain um it's mm -hmm. more a holiday destination in terms of where we are so when it comes to winter i've often uh, said it before when i'm out here training um and, yeah. and for a week in winter in december yeah. just before christmas um it's often like your i am legend it's like you, you know you don't see anything You're there on your own <laughs> i bet you like i bet you enjoy that so you, you get this about now and again you get a bit paranoid and it's like you just see these <laughs> things in the distance these wee figures and you think i wonder if that's zombies <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, think, I, mean, I, I like my own, I like my own time as well, but sometimes you could be a bit like feel like you're. I know that kind of feeling. So, but yeah, and that's because the whole place will be shut down for the winter months because everybody's back home. It's seasonal. Um, a lot of things are seasonal. Um, you, there's no doubt about that. You, you see that in a lot of areas um, where the shops, they, they are just pop-up shops for a period of time, and then that's them shut for the season, or they go on uh, shorter hours during that season as well. So you've got, you've definitely got to look into that, first of all, before just jumping into it and saying, yeah. oh, I could have a holiday left. Equally, there's people who actually done service accommodation in some of the worst areas, in uh, Leanmouth, for example. And it's mm -hmm. like they've got, they've got five star ratings on TripAdvisor and everything. Yeah, <laughs> no. like, you're having a laugh, really. And they're charging an absolute arm and a leg. And I'm thinking, wow, good on them. Good on them. Yeah, yeah, 
It's the misconception in other people's minds about how people outside the area will see their, their place. A classic example is when Jade went on to X Factor and says, where do you come from? She went, oh, but I aye, but it's a bit of a dump. Aye, oh, I don't know. that. And there was a huge <laughs> backlash in the, you know, in the media and stuff like that, locally anyway, saying, God, imagine saying Buckhaven's a dump. Buckhaven is far from a dump. It's a really, it's, it's a dorm at the end of the day. It's to service yeah. London, you know, leading the main shopping facilities. But Buckhaven's pretty good. It, it was yeah. voted by the Bank of Scotland as the, in 2010, as the, the least expensive seaside town in the whole of Britain. And, it's like, and there's a lot of history with Buckhaven. And see the views at Buckhaven Brain. Seaside town, least expensive. Oh, there's an up and coming area to invest yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's there's a lot, like I say, there's a lot of history there with, with being a fishing town. And do you know you go up to? I was going to say Buckhaven Brays, but I'll say Buckhaven the Buckhaven Brays. Uh, but it's Buckhaven Brays. The views there are amazing, right across yeah. the Firth of Forth. That's unreal. Um, you would pay a lot of money for that further along the coast. Um, that yeah. if you start that on a TikTok or an Instagram like yep. we are here just now, um, I, I, and actually showed that people would go, Bloody hell, where's that place? And then if you mentioned there's by the way, there's a property here for, for 50, 60 grand, it's like, what? Really? Yeah. <laughs> to, to people from the city, it's like that's just pocket change. Yeah, you know, that I could easily buy that and I could have a wee trip every now and again. My friends could have a wee trip and we could, you know, this could be perfect for us in a seaside location. But and that, you could that, be, that, you could be in the, that. and you could be in the East Newk and St Andrews and everything within 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, definitely, I would say so. Everything's easily. You could be right smart bang in the centre of Fife, um, and you're you're within a coast, um, a, a coastline uh, within about twenty five to thirty minutes yeah, either way. Yeah, yeah, yeah So you have you have the best. That, I would say that you, you sometimes see the best of both worlds. It's like you know you've got the best of every world. Um, when you're in Fife, because it's such a, a strong effect of the whole of the UK in terms of you can go anywhere in Fife and have a different experience. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can pick and choose what you want. It's kind of like being a, a kid in a candy shop. Well, Dunfermline's a city now. It's got city status. Yeah. So, Absolutely. but let's talk. Yeah. For the people on TikTok, you've just joined us. I know it's live and all the rest that you don't get re you don't get replays on TikTok, by the way. It just runs live and that's it. So yeah. if you've just joined us, you'll know we'll go back and see the start of this. Um, I will ask, answer questions at the end. Um, and we're round about we're probably about another 23 minutes to go, 20 minutes or thereabout. Yeah. And then we're just gonna we're, we're, Yeah. Yeah, we're now gonna talk, we're gonna talk about uh, HMOs. I mean, we touched on it slightly as we were going through there because we're talking about student lets, but HMOs, um, also known as a uh, multiple lets, uh, a house of multiple occupancy, so each a house of multiple occupancy. It's a property where three or more tenants who live um, as separate households. So, yeah. do you know, it's like different levels and things. And, and like like use... now, just to explain to you what three or more tenants are, if two of you are related, that classifies as one tenant. Therefore, yes. two could be related and one could be not related to them. And that's only two. Therefore, yeah. that's not an HMO. Yeah, that's that's. I've seen people use that uh, set up to get around the uh, not having an HMO license, but having more than two tenants. There's some there's some tenants that are, are, are there's some people that are living landlords, so therefore they yeah. don't need to have that at all. It's not an HMO because they live in the property. And they actually get really good tax allowances as well. They get the rent a room scheme, which is a great yeah. tax allowance every single year. So some people in the St Andrews they they actually do that, which good on them if it's there use it and it's a great it's a great great way to increase wealth and also give them a sale of short-term income in the, in the meantime yeah definitely i mean by renting out rooms separately you could generate extra income yeah. uh, and more single tenants are choosing this option as rents obviously continue to rise a bit in, in certain areas uh, but there are some things to consider with hmos as well and living in one room is not a life goal for most people so expect a higher turnover i mean people i mean you're not going to have really long-term people staying in one room uh, yeah. so a turnover of tenants um then a, a group of friends sharing a, a home together do you know what i mean so you will you yeah. will have a higher turnover definitely and properties with five or more occupants generally need additional health and safety measures um i mean this is i say generally they, they will yeah. Uh, which can affect the future sale value if buyers need to remove things and do you know if there's if there's a uh, like fire lobbies and fire doors and do you know things like that that need to be put in place there's definitely all these extras that need to be in there um and unconnected people as you say jim with completely separate lives are less 
likely to resolve conflicts between themselves. So you could end up being a wee bit uh, in between here, and mediation skills will come in very handy if you're if you're obviously running things Just yourself. My initial experience of uh, HMOs when I first started all these years ago, it would tend to be the um, because of the areas that I actually invested in. It tended to be landlords with HMOs in areas who are uh, um, universal credit, in other words, people are on on benefits. Uh, and they only needed one room because they were single guys. They were maybe under 25 at the time. Therefore, they weren't able to get the allowance. So they rented mm -hmm. to them. But it was very, very challenging for them. And that's what always put me off HMO because it's like there's no... When you work out the amount of resources it has to go in, because often they, they had to they had to have someone on the door, almost like a bouncer, you know, who, who was yeah. there to make sure everything was OK from time to time. So that costs money as well. Um, so that that was what drove me away from HMO straight away, and and the prospect and in the areas I was investing. I, I'm, I'm now I could have gone further afield. You can go to Glasgow, you can go to Aberdeen, and you could go to St Andrews. You could do HMO. You could go to some of the city areas, and HMO will work very very well. Um, but I'm still a, a, an acres of diamonds landlord. In other words, yeah. all these investment opportunities are on your on your doorstep. Why do I need to go anywhere else to get that? Mm -hmm. You know, it, all it does, it it, 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 de it it requires more skill and expertise from other people, which costs a hell of a lot more money. And it's it's unmanageable if the unthinkable happens where where your costs get so high that you can't afford, you know, the rent to offset against them. Therefore, you have to self-manage. I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan of use a property manager because it saves your time if you can invest that and make more money on your time but i'm also a big fan of well is plan for the worst and you know with the opportunity that you might have to take that back someday if base rates go to an astronomical level of 10 percent or something and then you yeah. find yourself in a position where you don't really want to sell because the asset maybe don't doesn't realize enough or it might realize too much or you're in a negative equity situation where you, you've remortgaged too much, therefore you've got deferred capital gain, um, and that's where it makes it difficult for you. So make sure you're always in a position that you could self-manage if you need to, and that will save a significant amount of money for you in the worst-case scenario. This is all yeah. about sensitivity analysis and risk analysis. Yeah, and if you work in the cost of management always into your initial uh, numbers, then you've got that buffer to fall back on because if things like interest rates and that change you could you could take that out but just always be prepared that you may have to if you have to do that as a last resort you will have to self-manage so be prepared to and and be able to do that if you need to um yeah. but yeah uh, so yeah if you're, but if you're thinking of turning your buy to let into an hmo check first with the local authorities about license restrictions and things we spoke about that and St Andrews area and things at, at the moment and any required planning permissions and things that you need to convert a property into that as these can vary from street to street basically uh, so you yeah. really need to make sure you check all that as well so HMOs uh, there's a lot involved just like holiday lets and things as well and um, and we're finally going to talk about short term and corporate lets uh, which we touched on just at the, at the beginning uh, briefly Jim now mm -hmm. the short term let market is mostly a mix of people in need of temporary accommodation. So perhaps maybe they're renovating their home, maybe they're, I don't know, moving for work and things, or they're only here for a short term, or from visitors on business trips and things, like I said, yeah, uh, or even works, works the convents. People get years, year out of convents and things. You do, and you also get people with insurance claims where their house has maybe gone on fire and they yeah. have to move on a short term basis to a short term let. And we used to get that quite a lot, where people would come yeah. at us and say, you know, can we have your place for six months? But at the time, it was short of short tenancy, so we actually insisted it has to be for yeah. six months. And the insurance company went, yeah, that's fine, we'll pay the six yeah. months. Yeah, I think I've done one of them recently, actually, on a PRT, and it worked fine. But yeah, generally, it worked a lot better with the, with the short of short tenancy. But yeah, we still do get that. Well, a risk um, from an insurance point of view, and just a risk from an insurer's point of view, is because PRT is now there. Um, the tenant may the person the person may actually say, "Tell you what, I'm actually going to go to move, move back to my house anymore." I'm I'm like this one there. <laughs> yeah, I know it's daft, but but that could happen. You know, where somebody could do that. Therefore, it's the insurance company that's obligated to pay for it. Therefore, yeah. the insurance is actually the insurance company's actually left themselves wide open. Wide open. In that yeah. 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 Although but, I mean that. Although I've got personal experience in insurance companies, and sometimes they just wash their hands and walk away and say, "Oh, take us to court then. Go will cost you a fortune and time and money." See, and then you're you're on a hiding and nothing trying to do that. But anyway, yeah, those are worst case scenarios. But it can happen. 
definitely. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, these kinds of people that are, uh, like I say, if they're renovating their homes or, or here for work and all the rest of it, then they're generally looking for all the comforts and convenience of their own home. And uh, rather than simply uh, a base for sightseeing and things like maybe holiday lights and that, so expect more cooking and general activity at the property because they will be living in it like they would their own home uh, mm -hmm. rather than they would a holiday let. Do you know what I mean? So they're there for a longer period, although it's still shorter term, but th there's going to be a lot of uh, living and wear and tear and things as well. Interestingly so, enough, Richard, uh, interestingly enough, just to, uh, it just popped in my mind the other night. I just actually saw a post last night about someone uh, on local on the local channel saying, "Oh, uh, we've got a home office contract." Well, you know what that means. <laughs> it's like, and I thought, "Ooh, this reminds me of 20, 25 years ago when there was a home office contract." And it's like, "Oh no!" Nah. And for me personally, as soon as I hear that phrase, it's like, "Ooh." run for the hills <laughs> run for the hills because i tell you what that's not going to work out well because often these people that have these home office contracts are they've just they've just appeared out of nowhere that you know mm -hmm. they've just popped up and the home office has obviously given them the contract based on value for money but they've not actually looked behind the full emphasis about done their due, due diligence about who this person is and what track record they've got. They just look, oh, that'll be value for money, or it's maybe their best bud has <laughs> got the company. Yeah. <laughs> Let's call them out on that. That's obviously yeah. what happens sometimes. It's their yeah. best yeah. buddy. It's, it's got the company that the offer the, the, the award the contract to, who makes millions out of it. Not to mention any baronesses. <laughs> they always moan all the time <laughs> yeah um, so, yeah, so, that's the, so that's the sort of thing you've got to watch out for with that it might seem very very attractive but just be careful do your due diligence yeah but I mean these kinds of short term and corporate lettings and things they do tend sometimes to be near city areas business areas uh, like conference venues, if you're down, if you're at cities and things, um, just for optimum accessibility for the types of people that are obviously going to be uh, looking for that type of accommodation. And uh, bookings can be anything from a few days to a few months. So you, know, so you could see how it could span obviously a longer period of time than just a holiday let, but are generally longer than a holiday let at home uh, and shorter than the, the typical tenancy. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, that's somewhere in between yeah. it. So, and that's where it's uh, that's where it's obviously like the short term corporate let title. So you'll have a fewer changeovers than holiday lets, but you're still responsible for all the cleaning, mm -hmm. the fresh towels, the new bedding, um, and things. And if, if they're there for a few months, then you're going to have to supply this throughout that time as well. Um, and then obviously there's bills and things included as well. So you think about utilities and that they're all they're all included in this. I did that in the first instance. I remember when I first started in buy to let, I did fully furnished properties. And and, mm -hmm. and and the fully furnished properties was an attractive investment for me because I worked out it was cheaper for me to provide the furnishings in full with the amount of generously generous tax deduction you got from your top line rent. You know, you were getting 10% um, in terms of an allowance of your top line mm -hmm. rental level. And the 10% on the tax level worked out a lot more than it was to provide the furnishings. So mm -hmm. it made sense for me to provide the furnishings, which weren't taxed at all at that time, and get the 10% wear, uh, wear and tear allowance, it was called. Um, so that's why I got involved in the beginning. And I, but I tell you what, it takes a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of resource as well. And obviously, and sometimes a lot of these things, if you don't buy the best quality in the first place, which actually costs a lot more money then, remember, um, yeah. then, then it falls apart and you have to replace it again and again and again. So again, it's the time associated and everything like that. So in hindsight, um, and looking back on it now, you know, it worked for me. I would never change that, by the way, because the experience was a, was a learning opportunity. You've got to look at that, you know, when something doesn't go what you expected it to go and it wasn't as great as it was, then it's an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, either an opportunity to learn or it's an opportunity to, let, to earn. That's it, really. Um, so that's how I looked at it in the beginning. Uh, so it cost a lot of time and effort to do it, but it was worth it in terms of the generous tax reductions. As soon as it got taken away, I'm stopping doing lettings with furnishings. That's it, done. We're not doing anything. Because I had a whole, I had the whole of Caledonian house. You know, the whole of the back of the Caledonian house was stacked yeah, high. Yeah. You know, and furniture and fridge freezers and washing machines and all the rest of it. And it's like, I don't hold any of that stuff now. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Because if we need that, or if anybody needs it, we don't supply it anymore. We just go yeah. to something like Key Fund, um, and or we go to Furniture Plus. Or furniture, furniture Plus, yeah. The Castle Furniture Project, and uh, and say to the person, go to them, and we might help you out. Um, but but we're not wanting to supply white goods um, anymore. The minimum I would supply though is white goods because I do the oven off of an extractor. Oven off an extractor, yeah. I and think then, that's important to provide oven, some sort of yeah, cooking facility. Where they, where they don't have a garden, you make sure you just provide a washer dryer as well. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a garden, you provide a washer dryer so somebody's got some facilities. And, and the reason that you do that is because so you want the ministry have got the integrated no, washers. They don't start drying everything on the radiators. Because then mm -hmm. that's what, then the next thing that comes out of that is, I've got damp. Well, <laughs> yeah. not really got damp. You've got condensation. <laughs> and yeah. what do you think's caused that? Uh, oh, I don't know. It's obviously there's rising damp. There must be something wrong with the property. Quickly onto the council and complain. The council's on you like a ton of bricks. And then the yeah. next minute you get a report and it says, uh, actually the tenant's drying all their stuff on the radiators. No ventilating the property, it's condensating to the back of the cupboards and, and 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 it's just nowhere to go, all this condensation. Therefore, it's black spot mould, which is generally just that. And the fact is, some of them actually don't even bother to wipe it down. I know. It's like, okay, know. I'll just sit there and I'll just, <gasps> I'll just I'll ingest just it. Yeah, hey, well, I'll just sit and ingest it. I'll not wipe it down, I'll not wipe off, I'll not look after my health, I'll just ingest it. Oh, but it's the landlord's. No, it's not the landlord's responsibility. If it's your condensation that's causing this problem, then it's your responsibility under your tenant it. duties. There is tenant duties under the legislation. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. tenant duties to go and rectify that yourself. And just like if you got up in the morning and your window was covered in water, sometimes you just wipe it down. Because it's down and open the window. Ah, it's condensation from you breathing and you're and when you're in your bed at night and yeah. the windows are all shut. No wonder it's condensated. Where else is it going to go? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there is a responsibility on a tenant. And I've been in some over the years and people like to have stuff and the amount of stuff in, a, in one room and there's clothes drying and there's no window open and, the, you know, and they're, they're complaining about the walls and it's and you, you have to explain to them, like, well, take a look around. And there's <laughs> a fridge freezer in the hall. What? Yeah. <laughs> Not a place in the kitchen for that. Oh, oh, I've yeah. just, just left it there. It's like, but a fridge freezer is not meant to be in a hall. It's not meant to be in a bedroom. It's meant to be in the kitchen, and there is a place in the kitchen for it. So why is it not in the kitchen? So that's yeah. the type. Sometimes that's the type of things you've got to deal with as a as a letting agent and as a landlord of yourself managing, especially. And if you don't want to deal with things like that, then get a good letting agent or don't yeah, do this yeah. at all. Because these are things that you deal with on the daily. Hearted. It's no for the faint hearted doing property letting, especially with what's going on right now. You're getting, oh, you're getting it from both both sides. You're basically, mm -hmm. you're, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. But I'm like, to everybody else, when they're all, all you know, upset about it on social media, I'm like, yeah, I'll tell them something I've never heard before. <laughs> it's, yeah. That's just the way it is. People just like to moan. People like to, what is it? People like to see you get ahead, but no ahead of them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. But yeah, but short term lets and corporate lets. So with a suitable location and significant investment in furniture and luxury gadgets and things, short term lets, they can fill a middle ground between the stability of long term letting and the constant churn of holiday makers. Um, so I mean, it's one to consider, obviously, if it's right for you. But you need to take all these points that we covered. If you want to put your cost for the mass, Richard, what option would you choose right now in property lending and why I, what I, one would, would you go for any of these if you're going to pin your cost to the master or would you go for standard short term would you go for well, standard you know residential residential rent? yeah I, I mean if, if you look at how we broke it down today look at what's involved in student lets holiday lets hmos even the short term and corporate lets that we just covered there there's so much expense and time i think even if you've got an agent coming in to help you with that, you've got all the initial setup. Can you need to do a lot of that as well? There's so much involved. And there is obviously initial setup and cost involved in long-term residential. But if you've got a good agent, I mean, you've got completely unfurnished, apart from maybe the essentials, like we say, of an hob extractor and things too, yeah. obviously. Yeah. You've got so much less um, need for responsibility on costs for repairing and turnaround and changeover. And definitely for me, and not just because obviously I deal with it day in day out, and that's what we do. And that's and obviously you've got such a, a, a such a, a portfolio, such as a long term residential that 
that I look after for you as well. It's just, I think there's so much less hassle and time involved for the individual. Uh, no matter how good arrangement you've got doing your holiday lets or got doing your, your HMOs. HMOs is a big one, but HMOs has got so many, like, uh, there's so many landmines and things that you could come across with HMOs. I think um, it's easy enough to get a letting agent. It deals with mainstream residential renting. Um, yeah. So if, you ever, if, if anything happened to your existing letting agent, at least you can switch. Whereas it's not that easy to get somebody that specialises yeah. in holiday lets and HMOs and student letting and short-term corporate lets as well. Yeah. It's not that easy to get somebody like that. And, and I, I keep going back every single time to, to, to the fact that if this is based on your ability to perform, in other words, you've got to be involved in this, for this time, money, yeah. then this is a job you've just given yourself. This is not an investment income. And this is when I go back to saying how the HMRC treat this, the, the inland revenue, as Schedule A is under, which is investment income, rather than Schedule D, case one and two, which are businesses that you run, and um, which is yeah. a totally different deductions, totally different way they actually treat it. Um, that's when I think you've got to look at it and think to yourself, did I actually get in this for a job? And if the mm -hmm. answer is no, then you should be doing main, mainstream residential renting. You should not be involved in any of these other ones because it's not that it's not that easy to do. It may mean it may mean seem attractive high returns, but remember, you're getting told this from property trainers. Yeah. Now most of them are furus, fake gurus. You know, they're only showing you a lifestyle that you could have, and they're telling you big numbers. And you see the classic TikTokers and all the rest of it. It's like, I make, you know, six times as much as a residential property mm -hmm. out of this one, and the, this cost me this, and this is my investment. But but they never go on about the fact that, okay, what's the time involved to do this? <laughs> and then what is the running cost of this? They always talk about the things that will make it look good. They do, you know, it's the, it's the benefits. But they don't yeah. talk about the things that you've got to go through to get that, the hoops that you need to jump through. That's what that's what I I look behind that every single time. When I'm when I'm when I'm do when I see an opportunity, I always do really good due diligence now because I understand the process. So it's pretty easy and straightforward for me to do and the key indicators I need to look for to make sure this is a viable option straight away. And if these key indicators tick the box, then after that, it's a detailed due diligence when I'm going through the process of actually um, buying buying whatever it is I'm in, or investing whatever it is I'm investing in. And then if all these um, come up with the same answer as what you did in your initial investigation, then, then we're on to a winner. Um, yeah. But if they don't, then at least you've gone through that process and you understand. And it gets easier every single time. You know, um, it's just like for most people investing in, you know, when they go to buy businesses, they know exactly the key indicators to look at a business and the key people to make sure that they've been there and, and they're going to be retained in order for that business to run. Because if you yeah. have a business and then all of a sudden you sell it to someone else or you buy it on a business from someone else and all the key people go, well, I'm going to go away and do something else now. It's like, that's no longer a business. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. just inherited yourself a job. Yeah, you've just given yourself a job. Yeah, definitely, which takes up a lot of time and effort. And I think if if you are considering maybe to to switch to one of these models that we've we've spoke about today, then then I'm happy to have a chat with you, not to not to turn you around and say no, it's wrong, because it might be right for certain individuals. Yeah. But I mean, I'm happy to have that chat. Or if you really are looking to maybe increase your profitability on your existing. Uh, portfolio or, or your, your uh, properties for let uh, and long-term residential letting then uh, by all means get in touch um, if you'd like any advice maybe around finding tenants uh, how to get the best rents um, and how to work with uh, good letting agents and things like obviously myself and others and uh, uh, different areas as well my mobile number my email and other things in the blog that's attached to this post I'm available any day anytime and happy to have a chat about that. Perfect. And I'm not available any day. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case anybody was thinking that. It's like you're the available. Is, though, Jim, I get a lot of people coming to me to and then and then and and the the, uh, the long run get uh, advice through me uh, from yourself through me as well. because uh, I know you you're you're busy doing a lot of other stuff. I do get yes, absolutely. I'll qualify that because I, I I said that just to just to make everybody sure it's like he's no an open book. Um, um 
you know, if, if somebody comes to me and, and they say to me, I'll point them in the right direction um, because I often know the answer to their problems and I often know yeah. who can actually answer that question for them. If, if I don't have that answer for them, then I'll go and find out that answer because it teaches me something as well. Um, oh, so, yes, that, that can happen. And I do get requests now and again. But but sometimes you just genuinely have to say, look, you know, I, I just can't, I can't afford the time. Um, because yeah. the investment and the time I've got to do something for you. But the great thing is, that's why we did the wealth of the bank of the wealth creation shows. Yeah. But the wealth creation shows are up to like episode 84 now. And if you watch these wealth wealth creation shows back to front, it's, it's and on on the, God, it's a masterclass and everything that you need to know to develop wealth and build yeah. for the future. Um, and that's that's why I did that more than likely as well. I'm going about it for my children and generations to come. But if it teaches them, then it will teach everybody else without yeah. ever having to get involved in it um, because we've said it all already and I'll just be saying the same thing again. That's why I used to say to you, should I just not tape this and actually just play it back <laughs> to you the next week? I know, I know. That's true. Because you used to ask the same question all the time. And I was like, I I'm like okay, I'll just tape the answer and then I'll play it back to you next week. <laughs> and then that's where we formulated the wealth creation shows in the back yeah. of that and thought to ourselves, this actually makes sense that I've just pre-recorded this and let everybody see it. And, yeah. and it's free. There's no upsell. There's no yeah. upsell. Yeah. The 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 We're well, not after anybody's business or anything like that. We'd love it if people came to use us, you know, um, but yeah. that, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the mentality or the ethos behind it. Uh, what's the yeah. Wealth Creation Show we're doing this week anyway, you know, on Monday? So on Monday, we are doing a save, a spend, share and invest. So four ways to use your money. Uh, maybe not technically in that order. It just sounded quite good to go in that order because I know, yeah. Jim, uh, your ethos on how to um, use your money in a certain order. Um, but yeah, that's going to be a good one. We're going to look at that. So save, spend, share and invest. Uh, 12.30 on days. Monday. 12.30 uh, Monday. And I will probably be on the beach at that time. So TikTokers, Instagrammers, unfortunately, you're going to have to tune in to the YouTube channel live yeah. if you want to or on our Facebook channels, either my public or my personal profile, Jim yeah. Parker, or um, onto the YouTube um, uh, Five Properties TV channel. Um, purely for the fact that I run independently the two cameras I've got. Uh, people don't see this setup. I know, but it's just like you're talking. Yeah. Literally, li 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 literally I'll, I'll show you. I'll see if I can I'll see if I can show you that. See, you've got two cameras there. Yeah. There's yeah. Instagram and there's TikTok sitting there. As well, and, and and literally that's how I do it. And then I've got my laptop in front of here, which streams onto all the other channels like LinkedIn, like YouTube, like the Facebook profiles as well. Um, and that's how we're doing it. So unfortunately, if I'm on a beach, I could only do it from my phone. So I've only got one port of call. Um, but the good thing, the good thing is, and it's obviously technology now, is I could sit here in the studio, run things, and you could be anywhere, Jim, and, and you just you just jump yeah, in. Yeah, and, as I am. Yeah, and we do this live. It's good. It's brilliant. So. <laughs> Monaco springs in my mind somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it. It's in the back of my mind there sometimes about Monaco. There's somebody's dropped that seed in and it's like, ooh, maybe I should go to Monaco. Anyway, apart from that, uh, you know, yeah. thanks very much for hosting the show, Richard. Really appreciate that. Oh, uh, good. And it's uh, yeah. always yeah. good to get insights on the different uh, the, the different types of lets and, and how they may suit you. And like I said, my contact details are in, in the blog attached. So feel free. And uh, we'll leave it there for this morning, and we'll see you all on Monday. You did an update. Or you did, did you do the update last night? Are you doing? I doing an update tomorrow night for the Sunday for the Five Property Update, and uh, and, and I'm taking a break again as usual. And um, but we'll see you Monday, twelve thirty. Yeah, perfect. Okay, bye bye for now. Oh yeah, okay, thanks. Bye.